Hello and welcome to the big picture. Lakhs of people are back at the Tahrir Square in Cairo as we witness a reenactment of the Arab Spring one year after the first democratically elected government came to power in Egypt. The uprising this time is against the Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi, who had replaced the Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak after people of the Egypt forcefully ousted him. Now the people of Egypt see Morsi as a failure, as the economy of the country is in doldrums, the political parties are in disarray, and the government is seen as a failure. Hundred, uh, nearly 40 people have been killed in the violence which has erupted. The army, which is seen by the people as a symbol of national integration, has given an ultimatum to Morsi to step down, and the deadline will end any time now. However, Morsi has refused to step down so far and sees himself as defending democracy. However, his party, the Muslim Brotherhood, seems, sees the uprising as against Islam. We will discuss the situation in Egypt and see what it means and if the fight is between the Islamist forces and the democratic forces and what we can expect in the coming days and weeks. To discuss this, I have with me Professor Mushirul Hassan, a renowned historian, director of National Archives and former Vice Chancellor of Jamia Millia University. Shivshankar Mukherjee, former ambassador, Professor A.K. Ramakrishnan of the Center for Western Asian, Study, West Asian Studies in JNU, Gulchan Luthra, editor of Strategic Affairs, and Sandeep Dikshit, senior assistant editor, The Hindu. Welcome to all of you. Uh, let me, uh, Professor Hassan, you know this, uh, what we are witnessing now, this people-led effort, one year back, one and a half years back, we had seen what, what happened there. The, the, the people are back in Tahrir Square. So is it some... Is it an effort of the people to convert a popular movement into a legitimate democratic uh, you know, institutions, to create some legitimate democratic institutions? Or is it, or they see this man as a failure in one, isn't it too early for them to decide that this man is a failure in one year? Well, I, before I answer this question of yours, which is a very important one, I think it's uh, important not to lose sight of the big picture, which is, which it seems to me is uh, provided by the destabilization of Iraq. Uh, we are going uh, further back into history, but I think it's very important uh, for the viewers to keep that in mind. And it seems to me that a lot of developments that have taken place in the Arab world, uh, in Egypt, and of course uh, for the last couple of years in Syria, and in Yemen, and in several other countries, uh, are very, very closely linked with, uh, with the American, you know, design of destabilizing uh, Iraq, and I think that is that is now having an effect. Uh, you are linking the, uh, the I'm, Ameri I'm linking it with the, the American, with the, the American with the action in Iraq with what is happening in Egypt now. I'm linking it up with the popular popular upsurge, okay. which finds which finds expression in some sort of. A uh, popular upsurge can also be an expression of resentment to something that may have ha may happen in your neighborhood or some in your neighboring country. It can also be an expression of resentment against the regime, which is what what uh, the case was uh, in Egypt against Hosni Mubarak. But but I think these are very strong expressions of of protests against the the meddling of particularly the United States, but certainly uh, some, of its, uh, some of its allies. I think it's important to lose sight, not to lo lose sight of that. Uh, coming back to your specific question, I think uh, as we were discussing earlier uh, with uh, Mr. Mukherjee that once uh, you have an authoritarian regime in place for a very long time, uh, uh, then suddenly there is this pent up energy right. which is released which is what the case is and the unfortunate thing about Egypt is the kind of polarization that has taken it did not happen in Iran for example after the Khomeini revolution there was no polarization there was a general consensus in favor of Khomeini but in certainly in the case of Egypt there is this polarization yes. between the uh, Islamic Brotherhood as well as the Democratic parties. So I've caught up as, as uh, you know, that society or that country is between these two highly ideological and highly polarized. And their ideology and polarization is also in a certain sense linked to what happened in Iraq. 
So I don't want to lose sight of, <laughs> of that factor. You are, you see. Coming back repeatedly to that, let me get Mr. Shivshankar Mukherjee. Uh, Mr. Mukherjee, in, uh, Professor Hassan has raised very interesting issues. He is linking uh, things to Iraq, to the US action in Iraq. But uh, people of Egypt, do they, at the same time he says that there is this, you know, uh, f there are different forces working within, within Egypt. So do you see this also as some kind of a US inspired effort or is it a local uh, frustrations being vented by the people? Well, uh, on two things I would agree with Professor Mosherul Hassan completely. Uh, one is the fact that Egypt is a deeply polarized city to, uh, nation state today and I'll, I'll explain how it has uh, become so over the years. And uh, <clears throat> The fact that uh, there, there is <clears throat> there is an outside element. I would say it's not. I, I I wouldn't go in for conspiracy theories. What I would say is that the American action in the Middle East, <clears throat> particularly in Iraq, has destabilized and and uh, <clears throat> the, the 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 whole region. In a sense, uh, it has imposed uh, imposed a certain disorder where there was order, and unfortunately that order mostly was evil. Uh, it was a dictatorial order. Absolutely. So in a sense, we should welcome the advent of democracy. But the fact is that after, uh, I would now like, like to go straight into the domestic arena of Egypt, which I think has its own momentum and is by far the most important reason. Right. Having lived there, uh, Egypt uh, has always been hyperactive in terms of intra-Arab politics. Right. Uh, there is it's not been a single been conference. been at the center of the... Uh, well, they call it the heartbeat of the Arab world. Damascus, absolutely. The heartbeats is Damascus and, and, and Cairo. Yeah. Now, uh, if you look at uh, Egypt over the last, not just uh, since the ouster of Hosni Mubarak, but years before that, and definitely in the last few years, the economy is in a shambles. Absolutely. Joblessness is, uh, is, is, is at, a, at a level where frustrations among the youth are even some years ago, was total. Uh, I mean, one of the things I used to hear most of the time from friends was that there are hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of Egyptian youth who can't get married because they don't have they a don't job. They don't have a job. <laughs> so, uh, Egypt has, I think, four main sources of income. Right. You have tourism, you have some oil and gas from the Sinai, you have uh, uh, royalties from the shipping that goes through the Suez Canal, uh, and then you have uh, goods and services that the economy produces. The last part has actually shrunk. Uh, figures show they've grown by 2% or something. Basically, the economy is more or less shrunk. Completely. The, and a, a large the chunk poverty, of the revenue, which poverty is Poverty apparently has gone up from 40% to 50%. Exactly. People who live below $2 a day. And, and don't forget, a substantial chunk of the revenue, which is tourism, has totally disappeared right. because of the ferment. And uh, when tourism disappears in a country like Egypt, it's not just the revenue, it's jobs. It is so, one of the major... So, so what you're trying to say is that there is enough reasons for people within, to... Within, within Egypt, Egypt, for people to have reacted as they have. Hmm. Now, why again Tahrir Square? Why again after a year? Right. Uh, because, I mean, if you look at the... Uh, demands of the Tamarut, the rebellion. Right. They say they ha he hasn't delivered on... It's very nebulous, law and order. Exactly. He hasn't delivered on security. He cannot deliver in one in year. One year. So there are, there are and, and the polarization that I'm talking about is not one side and another. It's, it's multipolar polarization. It's the Salafists, who are basically, their base is Upper Egypt, which is the southern part of Egypt. It has always been so. It is the home of Hassan al-Banna, who is the founder of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin. They are the best organized and the most visible of uh, the components of the opposition and now Mursi, a former member, former because he's resigned, which resignation actually means nothing because you never resigned from the Ikhwan al muslim in, okay. in, in fact. So the fear among those who oppose him is that they're going to end up with uh, a, a government that does not deliver plus maybe an Islamist government that does not deliver. This is itself uh -huh. seen as an Islam. At least the Muslim Brotherhood thinks yes. that this is the Islam. There are also those who are supporters of the old regime. Right. And in that, 
the dangerous thing, I call it a dangerous thing because that hits at the grassroots of, uh, level, is the army. The, the army has ruled Egypt since the fall of the monarchy. Right. And uh, old habits die hard. I mean, the ultimatum that the army has given, which, which is about to be reached right. uh, to Mohammed Morsi and the government, is actually unconstitutional. What role has the army to... to yes, but, but, uh, Ram, Professor Ramkrishnan, it is very interesting that, you know, army, as Mr. Mukherjee says, it's unconstitutional for army to give such kind of ultimatums. But people seem to have reacted very, very positively to this ultimatum. From what we have witnessed, what's happening there when army helicopters are flying, people were cheering and, you know, how do you explain this? I think of the three political actors there, the military is a political actor. Yes. Very much so, um, very much so the Morsi and his government, the opposition forces and the military. Of these, um, the military played uh, a similar role that it, it's playing now when the Tahrir Square incident happened initially. Yes. Uh, there was goodwill between there the is, people and the military at that time. But when, is, you, you don't think there is, uh, there continues to be a goodwill for the army among the people? No, it, uh, uh, people's confidence was uh, lost. Uh, with a lot of efforts of Tantavi to hold on to power, etc. But ultimately, because of the continuous pressure from the Tahrir Square, uh, the military has to budge, uh, give the way for a, a civilian political process, and then the elections, the constitutional mechanism, and so on. Uh, what angered people now more, one, the economic situation as a already uh, been spoken about, but two, the fractured kind of verdict that Mursi got, Right. Um, it was almost half and half, <coughs> but he was uh, he, he behaving as just if, about, about 51 about yes, 51%. Yes, he was behaving as if it's a very overwhelming kind of majority, and the constitutional process of which the secular elements, women, and the youth who initiated the uh, you know, movement against Mubarak, all of them felt that... They have they, been left out. They have been left out and the constitutional process itself did not represent and, 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 democratic and his, aspirations. And his uh, failure to bring the opposition together and, you know, to work with the opposition in a, yes. in a constructive manner, that, is, that, that seems Mo to have been Mo one of the problems. actually failed to bring the nation together as a precedent. Uh, there was tremendous pressure from the Muslim Brotherhood uh, to, to make it uh, um, a, a, a constitution and a regime where the uh, you know conservative element hold on <coughs> to certain important kind of uh, okay. you know influence, so that is objected to, and there is pent up feeling as was mm. mentioned. So economy, the kind of disbelief in the president and his. Uh, inept dealing right. of domestic factors, everything together made okay, the movement uh, possible now. In Let fact, me he get appointed the head of the Gamaya al Islamiyah, hmm. who created the, who did the massacre in Luxor as the governor of Luxor. <laughs> uh, Sandeep, uh, coming to you, you know, they, here, you must have heard what, uh, what my guests here in the studio have said. But there are two I interesting angles to it. One, of course, is Professor Mushir al uh, uh, you know, angle that that we should not lose track of what happened in Iraq and you know subsequent events. He's he's linking those two events. But as far as what is happening in Egypt today is concerned, you think the U.S. is playing a major role in it, or how does U.S. look at this? What what's happening right now? Um, 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 those who spoke before me, of course, uh, they have made their points very well and very valid points too. But of course, the U.S. is involved in this. But apart from this, I think uh, we should not get impatient because democracy in Egypt is very recent. And uh, the kind of crisis that we see today is a result of the fact that from Nasser's time, Nasser's time, the Communist Party was merged with Nasser's party and then the socialists also dissipated. Ever since then, it was the only the Muslim Brotherhood which had a structure. Right. While the other political parties did not have a stru structure, Civil society groups were loose, scattered, they are like that even today. There is no one viable political party, major political party 
of these people. So in the elections, it was the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafist with their well-knit cadres, with their links who had withstood so many years of repression that they could harvest the votes and get more seats in parliament. That is one factor which is agitating it. But there are other players also, for instance, uh, the military was mentioned. Yes. There is also the judiciary. The judiciary in Egypt is also split. In fact, it is split into two associations right. who tend to issue statements against each other also. Right. And in fact, uh, if you recall that Mr. Morsi's uh, swearing in, uh, the condition was that he has to swear in front of the Supreme Court Chief Justice. And then a way out was found that he then took, a, uh, took oath in Tahrir uh, Square before the people and then went to the Supreme Court. Right. So really his path to power has not really been smooth. There is this Machiavellian army. If you uh, go through their statements earlier, they are full of traps, very political statements, give uh, absolutely no impression that they are on Morsi's side or try, trying to help a democratically elected person. So these are the difficulties, the early birth pangs that you are seeing in democracy. But uh, the fact remains as uh, uh, previously they have pointed out that the seeds of democracy have been sown. The seeds of the democracy. Se Seeds yeah. of democracy has been sown, but you know, it will take, as you are saying, that we need because to be patient. Because of the previous ways in which the country has been ruled for the last hundreds of years. Yes. That also has its impact today. Absolutely. That's what uh, Mr. Mukherjee also was pointing out, Mr. Lutra. You think that the role of the army now is, is, is crucial in the coming it, days? It has to be. We have to see that in most developing countries, people look at the army as the savior. Uh, you know, the, there, are, there is a history, you can link it to Iraq or whatever, but I would say that for the present situation, Mursi himself is responsible. Within six to eight months of coming into power, he was the Islamist dictator as the normal people or ordinary people started seeing him. I've been in touch with my friends. I haven't gone to Cairo for several years, but I'm normally in touch. There are correspondents here, there are correspondents in the Middle East. They all have been saying that within six months or so, uh, he started behaving as he was one up over his predecessor. Okay. So he's the one to blame. Uh, I think he had a great chance to stabilize the country. Probably he failed. As far as the economy is concerned, Mr. Mukherjee mentioned, there's just about 2% growth. The, there is no tourism because of lack of a poor economy. You're not getting the FDIs. There are hassles. But the government is there, and I think today, Army is playing a role and they probably are the only force, whether you blame USA, whether you blame others, but internally, Army is the only force along with the security forces which can possibly. That is right, but you know, it's very interesting that Army is seen as the uh, savior at this point of time, even by the people there. But uh, we, will, we need to go into a very short break now. We'll come back, we'll continue this discussion. Please keep watching. Welcome back. We are discussing the situation in Egypt and asking the question how, whether it is democracy versus Islam there. Professor uh, uh, Hassan, coming back to you. You know, with, with the process of democratization in these countries, we have seen this happening in Turkey recently, we have seen this happening in, uh, you mentioned earlier, Tunisia and all these uh, places. Now back in Egypt, is there some kind of a, uh, you know, uh, intolerance to dictatorships nowadays in, this, in these countries. How do you see this? And, and at the same time, there is this, you know, some, uh, some people think that democracy and Islam can't go together. Well, let me first clarify that I was not trying to blame the U.S. or any no, other no, no, power. Not, I'm, I'm not saying uh, that you, we, no, we no, never no, said that you are blaming the U.S. Not instiga <laughs> but, instigating, yeah. no, no, that's not my theory. My argument was that the, the uh, destabilization of Iraq had important consequences right. and one consequence is the kind of popular oh, very right. that very right. Absolutely. Uh, in response to, to this point, I think uh, to argue that Islam and democracy uh, are in any sense incompatible is, is such an old... It's an age-old theory. It is such a well-worn out <laughs> argument. That no, it doesn't th even deserve serious... That is, that is being disproved now? It doesn't and deserve serious... Is reputation. that being disproved now? Well, I think so. If you look around, I don't want to begin counting the countries, Muslim countries where democracy prevails. 
Uh, I think the, the point is not so much Islam, the point is the post-colonial uh, legacies of these societies and that is what has brought about the distortion. In today's present day discourses we have forgotten colonialism and what it did to, uh, I think particularly in India because we matured into a into a nation state but the same developments did not take place Maybe. in the Arab world because of the very nature of colonial colonialism and the colonial project. So I think part of the of the problem is that legacy uh, which is why these dictatorial authoritarian uh, regimes uh, have been in place and that they have received US support and legitimacy from from the United States and right. that's also an extremely important point and the US has always supported uh, and undermined democratic regimes as is evident from the case of Iraq uh, and the ouster of Musa Iran sorry and the ouster of of Musaddiq. So that is another story but an important part of the story which I think nowadays people lose sight of in international relations. From my point of view, I think the important thing about Egypt is the strength of the democratic and liberal forces. I mean admittedly the Muslim Brotherhood has been from Nasir's days uh, a very strong force in Egyptian politics. Oh, and and it has also its roots in many other uh, countries, there's no question about it. But it is also a case which is an important development, which in a sense uh, refutes the, those, those who look at Islam and, and democratic politics as incompatible, that there are these very powerful forces. And today, I think in many Arab countries, it's these democratic forces and the liberal aspirations of, 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 of these democratic forces which have come to the fore, which they hadn't under the dictatorships and the authoritarian, authoritarian government. Okay. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a very important, important development that there is an ideological struggle as well, apart from the triangular conflict between the army and the, and, and, and the Islamic Brotherhood. Okay. So there is this uh, upsurge of, and I hope, from my point of view, I hope that these liberal modernists for, you see, uh, Egypt, will, will a, Egypt is a very good example of a multicultural society. Yes. The uh, upsurge in fundamentalist, fundamentalism is also undermining the multiculturalism of that very beautiful country. Yes. Mr. Mukherjee, uh, do you agree with that? You know, Muslim Brotherhood was seen as a fundamentalist force which has, which has, you know, gained, which came into power uh, with Morsi becoming the uh, Prime Minister, you know, through a President. democratic election. Don't you see this dichotomy in this situation there in, in, in Egypt? <clears throat> uh, more importantly, the people in Dahri Square, the young, don't see it that way. Don't see it that way. They are angry because they feel that they've got rid of one oppressive regime so th and have not yet found something that is an mm. improvement on so the last So there is one. no ideological underpinning There is in this. very much an ideological underpinning in the Islamist forces. You know... No, uh, in the, the people in Tahrir the, Square? Not among them, but in, in, in terms of the National Salvation Front, the opposition, yes. uh, and now, of course, uh, increasingly within the government forces itself, the Salafists, the Ikhwan al muslimin are, in fact, better organized, uh, their cadres are better organized. You see, in any country I've noticed uh, in my service abroad, when the state fails to deliver, then forces come up to yes. deliver services to the people which the people need. And very often these forces but these, are fundamentalist. These forces, yeah, exactly. If you go to Upper Egypt, right. uh, from years before, the, it was totally neglected by the state. And it was totally under the thumb of the Ikhwan al muslimin who ran the schools and they ran it efficiently, they ran the clinics, they did all the, you know, all the work that the, the, they delivered the services that the people wanted. Uh, the ruling forces obviously did not like that. In Syria, to be a member of the Ikhwan al muslimin meant capital punishment. Sir, we, 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 need, we are running short of time, sorry. Uh, uh, Ram, Professor Ramkrishnan, very quickly. So this... Uh, the army, what, how do you see this whole thing panning out in the next, uh, say, now we, the deadline is ending and after that what, what, what will happen? It's difficult to say, but 
what will happen today and the next few days are extremely significant. Um, but if the military takes some steps, uh, it should immediately remember that it's not going to be easy as a military coup or anything of that the, sort. The, 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 the because be the people at Tahri Square, where Professor Mushirul Hassan is absolutely right, the ideological content of the movement, that the quest for democracy, uh, the assertion of people's will in Tahri Square, this is very important and it's a continuing saga from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, and therefore that will be a check. That will be a check. Um, Sandeep, last words to you very, very quickly. Yeah, it's a you very think? sad occasion. Yeah, it's a very yeah. sad occasion where uh, two, uh, two opposite forces which believe in the democratic process are pitted against each other. And it is the army which has been the oppressor for the past four decades which is acting as the arbitrator. Arbitrator so, and many yes, people see, the, see it as the saviour also. Yes, four decades record has not been too great for instance. Yes. So, uh, it's a sad occasion and then there's the judiciary also. So, I think the civil society of Egypt will have to get its act together at some point of time. Because the danger is that if democracy starts floundering and if there's uncertainty for a long number of years, then, uh, any kind, uh, then that sets the... Uh, ground for the rise of a despot, Absolutely. for instance. Mr. Lutra, democracy is under threat? I wouldn't say, uh, no. In fact, uh, I think it's the democratic forces which are propelling the second revolution, if you would call it. We must keep in mind that Egypt is quite close to Europe. If you go to Egypt, people, Quickly, are, sir. Yeah, yes. people are quite independent. Uh, I mean, they, they like independence, they are easygoing and happy. Uh, I don't think, but any revolution which comes once is not, uh, the stability doesn't follow immediately. This is perhaps another phase or so, but I think eventually Egypt will have democracy. Okay, on that note, I think we'll need, we'll, we'll need to end on that optimistic note, but we will have to watch what will happen tonight and in the coming, in the next 24 hours and 36 hours, how the army will react, how the people of Egypt will react. We'll keep a close watch on it. Thanks to all my guests, Professor Mushiril Hassan, Professor Ram Krishnan, uh, Mr. Lutra, Shiv Shankar Mukherjee, and Sandeep Dixit. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue on the big picture, same time tomorrow.